Good evening to people in the United Kingdom and good afternoon or good morning to wherever you are on the planet. The good news is this network is uh, is growing substantially and uh, it's really, really good to see uh, that so many of you uh, have signed up. It's really, really good news. Just uh, on a personal note, uh, quite a lot to tell you. Uh, some of you have come along to our true crime festivals that we've run in the the winter months. Oh, that's purely online. We're planning that at the moment. And I've got to tell you, some of the speakers that I've got are absolutely fantastic. We're probably going to do that in February. And this will really make you eat your heart out because since I last spoke to you, I've got two residences uh, on two British cruise ships, uh, which means in November... Uh, I'm going around the United States and the Caribbean. Uh, and then April next year, uh, I'm going to be doing exactly the same, except uh, around some Caribbean islands. So uh, that's quite good. And if I can, I'm going to try and run one of these events. Anyway, that's enough about me. There's a lot going on. It's really, really good to see new members and uh, past members alike. So um, I can't... Um, Unfortunately, uh, I can't do uh, this uh, event live because, uh, unfortunately, I'm abroad, uh, which is a which is a shame because I like to do that. And of course, uh, one of the things that we did last time is we looked at, uh, and I did this as a sort of an emergency. Really, uh, was looking at uh, inside the mind of Lucy Letby, and of course today. I explained to you there was a legal reason uh, why she has never apologised or anything like that. And that legal reason has come to fruition in that she has lodged an appeal, uh, which means obviously if she had apologised and uh, talked about her behaviour, uh, her appeal would have failed. So coming on to this evening, this is the world's worst murderers. And of course, one of the things that uh, I think is interesting about this talk is it depends on what you consider to be worst. But what I have done is I've created an index in which you can have a look at uh, different aspects of serial killing uh, and then apply those aspects to some serial killers uh, that you know. That will become um, clearer as we go through. But of course, this is subjective in your mind, what you consider the world's worst murderer. And I'm going to tell you uh, what I consider to be mine. So what are we doing uh, this evening? Well, most of you know who I am. My name is uh, Steve Gaskin. That's an old photograph uh, on the left hand side. That's when I was a DCI uh, and that was kind of equivalent to captain in the US. That's when I was a DCI in the Metropolitan Police Service. And uh, I've been the technical advisor to a number of uh, programmes, particularly uh, BBC Silent Witness. And I'm going to talk to you about a programme uh, that is being screened on ITVX, but you'll be able to see it all over the world, which will really blow you away. And some those are some of the cases that I've been involved in. So world's worst work murderers. Uh, some of you will remember this icon that I love uh, using. Uh, menu, what am I going to serve up? What does worst mean? How is it defined? Uh, your worst murders index. And that's something uh, that I've added uh, to the literature uh, in to be able to work out what is considered to be uh, uh, the worst serial killer. And that depends on what frightens you. Uh, I'm, I'm not in the business of doing that or what you consider to be the worst. We're going to have a look at the behavioural motivation, the why. And that is why we all come along here. That's why I've become very, very interested in this subject. And for the feedback, very good feedback, I have to say, that you've given me, that's why you come along to actually work out why. I'm going to talk about the worst of the worst. And I thought I would talk to you about the psychology of biting at crime scenes. Isn't that bizarre? If someone came in onto this uh, webinar, they might think that's bizarre behaviour. But actually, that's what I did uh, on my bachelor's dissertation, was looking at 
the psychology of bite of people biting each other. Not the science of who left the marks, but why they do it. And then we're going to look at some recommended reading. So here we go. I've put this slide up quite a few times. So again, you guys should be expert on it. And this is quite useful where police services have a behavioral science unit. It's a methodology or a method uh, to be able to not pigeonhole serial killers, but to look at some of the motivation. So let me briefly explain them again. Visionary is where someone gets a vision to go out and murder someone. Uh, often that person is suffering from some form of mental illness, psychosis, which, uh, for instance, which we're going to mention later on, or some erroneous message from some sort of deity or the devil, if you like, uh, to go out and kill. And already I want you to start thinking about who might come into that category. You then get into missionary, where the person is on a mission to kill in a serial mode. And uh, hedonistic is where people do it because they enjoy killing. And some of you have heard me say Ted Bundy. And there's more being written in the academe about Ted Bundy than any other serial killer. And uh, he said the having to, the power, and I quote, uh, in my hands to determine whether someone dies or not is the best feeling you can have. We then move on to power and control. And that tends to be uh, quite a few serial killings and the lion's share uh, where people are controlled by the power usually of a male. So we can see visionary and on a mission, probably Jack the Ripper spans those two quadrants. Uh, Harold Shipman, he was certainly on a mission to kill, that's for sure. But lots of people will argue that he should come into this power and control. Peter Cl uh, Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire rip Ripper, he enjoyed doing that. In other words, killing sex workers. You then got Fred and Rose West. Levi Belfield undoubtedly uh, was power and control. Uh, Stephen and Port, Stephen Port, the grinder murderer. Uh, and this is adapted from a great book called Serial Killings, um, edited and written by Holmes and Deboga. I'm actually quite proud of this because you know, I read stuff, uh, but I've actually designed this. And that is, it's called uh, My Worst Murderer's Index. Uh, and so let's say where I've put Adolf Hitler on here, you can put whoever you like in there. And then it's just a, sim a question of ticking whether this applies. Was Adolf Hitler a child killer? Answer, yes, he was. Tick. Number of victims huge millions of people that he put to death and uh, not only jewish people uh but uh, romanis gypsies homosexuals freemasons uh, anything that didn't accord to his area of view torture of victims a particular group murdered um you know so there is an incremental rise not exponential not a big rise in the amount of gay males that are killed uh, in the United Kingdom. Long period of operation, financial gain, a blatant killer, breach of trust, disposal, disregard of the body or bodies, and then some form of gruesome, sorry, gruesome method of killing. So what you can do is you can take that, and of course, I did a thing, and maybe I'll do that next year, on serial killer duos, uh, where there's mixed gender, um, such as in the Moors murders, uh, or uh, there's at least two or three people that conspire together to murder. So that's how that works. And um, as soon as you've watched this, or even in conjunction with this talk, uh, you can go on to my website, which is thecrimelab.co.uk forward slash resources, and uh, you'll see this here, uh, top of the tree. So what do you consider as worse? And what I'm going to do, <clears throat> again, and this is where I like bringing value uh, to, uh, to these webinars that I put on, is I'm going to also send you what I consider to be the world's top 10 worst murderers. 
um, and they've got different traits, but that will be a document again uh, that you can download uh, from resources. So you'll see that I'll do a blog called The World's Worst Murderers, and in there you can get that index. And also, uh, yeah, also there's a document, I think it's about five pages long, where it comes into some of these. So let's start going into there. What you what do you consider as worse? So let's look at this child killer. There was a guy in uh, Japan there. Uh, here's a picture of him in there that was terrible. I mean, he was uh, uh, used to uh, uh, bite children and and uh, remove their blood. Uh, awful, awful number of victims. Uh, this guy here it was considered. Uh, this here, Garavito, it was considered that he murdered upwards of 120, 130 people. Gruesome method of killing, Ted Bundy. Of course, we'll talk about that later. Torture of victims. And again, let's just pause for a minute. At the end of everything that I'm talking about, there are victims. There are victims' relatives. Uh, and we shouldn't really forget that. Torture of victims. Please, please see there that it's an S on the A on the end there. No uh, relative of mine at all. This is Donald Gaskins, whereas my name is Gaskin. Torture of victims as well. Uh, terrible. And the, he's one of the few serial killers that I know that had a double MO, a double MO. And you can read about him. A particular group of women, and you can see here Harold Ship, and the group he went for uh, was, of course, his patients. Long period of operation. Uh, Gary Ridgway, uh, lots of you know about that. There's been some good stuff on the TV recently. Netflix, I believe. There he is. Financial gain. And this was Mary Ann Cotton there, uh, known as a black widow. That is usually uh, worldwide uh, the principal reason for women committing serial crime. That is financial gain. Disposal disregard of the bodies. Uh, this ch chap here, he buried uh, in sequence or in series or in parallel, he buried his victims so that they were standing up in a field. Most bizarre. Breach of trust, medics, police. And of course, we've had that Lucy Letby case. Talk about a breach of trust there. Uh, and uh, we also look at uh, other people, uh, uh, notably in the Metropolitan Police uh, service uh, recently, particularly Wayne Cousins. On that point, uh, again, I'm not blowing my own uh, trumpet, but it, this was a very well produced program on Channel 5, and I had the privilege of, of inputting into that program, and it's called Wayne Cousins Killer in Plain Sight. And you can have a look at that uh, on, uh, Channel 5, on a Channel 5 app. Um, and this is a guy called Joseph D'Angelo who was a police officer in California. And then blatant killers like Hitler, uh, Joseph Stalin, our ally during the Second World War, and he killed more people than Adolf Hitler. Uh, and this guy is the world's worst serial killer in terms of volume and blatancy. You can see there Chair Chairman Mao, 45 million people. Well, the United Kingdom uh, was starved, shot, tortured, and worked to death. Well, in the United Kingdom, there are 66 million people. So that 45 million puts it into context. The behavioural motivation, the why. So let's have a look at this. One of the reasons is anger. And that anger can... Uh, can can come from all sorts of quarters. That anger can be immediate. It can be some sort of unrequited anger in your uh, youth, uh, in your adult life. And what I find really interesting, and I really need to look at this in a more scientific nature, I've looked at a few serial killers where their offending behaviour begins very shortly after they've been married. So what I'm trying to do is through the Centre for the Investigation of Serial Killers and Study of Serial Killers is to have a look at this and see 
if they're more people. So anger. So that is a major behavioural motivation for committing serial crime. Secondly, some form of criminal enterprise. If you look at the mafia, they're completely desensitised to humans. And uh, if you look at the Cray twins, and that annoys me when people say, oh, they were bad lads, you know, they sort of kept the peace and the law. No, they didn't. They were raging psychopaths and they had very, very little regard uh, for human beings. Uh, so you've got criminal enterprise. And don't forget the Nazis during the Second World War, a lot of what they were doing was around criminal enterprise. And that was theft, theft. Financial gain, we've talked about that, and that's the principal reason for female serial killers. Uh, often it's the case uh, where they will bump a partner off for insurance money uh, and then followed by children, other partners, et cetera, et cetera. Ideology, uh, that is where, uh, generally speaking, if you look at our country and the United States, 9-11, uh, that's where people believe that they have they're politically or religiously motivated and uh, they will go out and kill indiscriminately. Power. This is really uh, a big thing, isn't it, in this country? Having the power <clears throat> over someone else, having power over children, having power over women. There's lots of programmes and there's, in fact, a very good one come out on the TV uh, that I want to have a look at about coercive behaviour. And it worries me intently uh, in this country, particularly when you look at, and you need to hear me clearly here, what is available on the net for young, impressionable boys. What they think is normal behaviour. Things like strangling uh, during sex. Normalised behaviour that's becoming. Is it? I don't know. Psychosis, that's when this person is suffering from some form of mental illness. Sexually based, that is, again, huge. Uh, if you look at the principal reason for male serial killers, the principal reason they kill is for sexual reasons. And some of you have heard me say this before, and it's one of the most exciting things I've read and studied, and that is, it's to do with our ancestry, hunter-gatherers. Males, hunters, they would go out uh, into the, uh, you know, out hunting uh, and they would come back and uh, see their uh, see, see their women uh, who were gatherers, who would look after the children, cook, clean uh, in those traditional roles. But there was a correlation uh, around serial killing that shows that uh, the hunter, the male, will go out and they're sexually motivated whereas females will stay at home uh, and will kill people, generally speaking, that they know, whereas their male counterparts will, generally speaking, kill people they don't know. Anger is a motivation where an offender displays rage against a certain subgroup, uh, and that may have been the case with Peter Sutcliffe uh, killing uh, and Steve Wright, very close to where I live in Ipswich. Criminal enterprise, we've discussed this. Financial gain, black widow type killings uh, involving insurance or welfare fraud, we've discussed that. Uh, we've looked at uh, where, under power, where the offender feels empowered or excited when he kills his victims. And psychosis, hallucinations, paranoia, grandiose and bizarre del delusions. Uh, sexually based and we've discovered that I don't really think I need to go into this too much uh, but this is just here uh, for you to read again uh, this is one of my favorite slides it puts it into perspective the difference uh, between psychopathy and sociopathy uh, and uh, the some of the traits there but you can have a look at that stop and start this in your own time I find this, again, fascinating. And uh, isn't it interesting to have a look uh, uh, at the number of serial killers? And I got this directly from the Centre for the Investigation uh, and Study 
uh, or, and research into serial killings. But I'm going to put these slides up. Uh, lies. There are lies, damn lies in criminal statistics, because in order to get an accurate picture, what you need to be able to do is to find out the data from all countries. And there are, I'm not picking on these countries, but Chile, some of the South American company, uh, countries there, like Mexico, China is missing. Uh, but you can see there that uh, this is the country that produces the largest number and that is since 1888, when the records began. Uh, and you can see uh, that England has been uh, quite high, in a sense, compared with some other countries. How accurate those figures are, I don't know. Uh, but by any test there, you can see that the United States uh, really does hold the lion's share. The worst of the worst for me, and uh, again, don't, don't don't say to me, well, aren't child murders horrific? Of course they are. But for me, this is the worst. It's Joseph D'Angelo, who was a, a Californian police officer. Uh, you can see him there in orange. He used his power and control. That was his motivation. His sexual drive, uh, his uh, motivation to kill people and treat them as inanimate objects uh, using hiding under the cloak uh, of his police badge. And uh, he uh, he was operating for 10 years. This is one of the characters that I have identified, where his offending behaviour started soon after he got married. Uh, this guy was responsible for a huge amount of murders, uh, sexual abuse, uh, rape, burglary, uh, over a period of 10 years. And uh, it's worth having a look at uh, him, but the detection uh, to actually catch him was absolutely brilliant. I thought what I would do is just to share a bit of my university dissertation, and I'm going to try and uh, keep it orientated uh, in, uh, uh, in non-academic parlance. Uh, just excuse me for a minute. So, of course, what we have uh, is a uh, probably three parts to this. The first thing you have is the science, which is called forensic odontology, looking at uh, who done it, really. So if there's a bite mark on someone's skin, a forensic odontologist will have a look uh, to see who uh, sees bitten if they've got some teeth marks. So... The second thing is the ability of a technician to be able to produce some good uh, teeth marks. And the third bit is where we come in, is looking at the reasons why people do this. My mum, uh, my young mum, who's still alive, must have wondered what on earth I was doing uh, studying around uh, this particular subject. But I hope you find it fascinating. Damning evidence. Is it damning evidence? There is a problem uh, running through a lot of Western courts about the science of odontology. But here you've got Ted Bundy uh, and they are biometrics, your teeth. In other words, there's no person on the planet that's got exactly the same teeth marks. But with him, you could see his dentistry here. There is a pronounced lower teeth here. Uh, so bite marks, and this is how it was caught. You can see the bite marks on skin there has been traced. Quite often what they will do is to put a piece of laminate over the top of the bite mark and then draw these black lines uh, around it. And these are the teeth impressions uh, of uh, Ted Bundy himself. So unusual dentition there. And, uh, and uh, you know, this was what brought about his arrest. Why do people bite each other? Well, surprisingly, and this is what I enjoy doing, there's very little research around uh, this subject. There are three principal reasons why people bite uh, at crime scenes. The first one, and I'll talk about them in order of seriousness, the first one is called... Uh, it's called anger, impulsive 
biting. So the anger impulsive bit there is a result of frustration or incompetence to deal with a situation. So some people may, uh, during an argument, if they can't control themselves, they may act in a violent way by banging on the table, they may shout, they may assault someone. But some people will bite. And this may account for the disgraceful behaviour uh, of a, um, a footballer, Luis Suarez, uh, particularly as a role model to lots of uh, young people. But what I found to be very, very interesting is this. And what I'd like you to do is to pause for a moment, uh, particularly if you've got brothers or sisters, and ask yourself, did you bite or were you bitten by a one of your siblings? And that is when you're a young or tender age. I'm not talking about when you're 20, 21, 22. It's really, really interesting. And it tends uh, to be not the first child uh, in order, but the second or third child. So in my family, uh, uh, my parents had three boys. I'm the oldest, my middle brother, Pete, youngest brother, Phil. And my middle brother, Pete, was a biter. And you have to work out, start thinking about why that was. But what I found really, really interesting is by research and talking to people and looking at case files, the principal reason for people biting when they're young children is jealousy. I found in 80% of the cases. But what's even more exciting is I that concluded that uh, this follows on into adulthood. And for a lot of biting reasons, it's often jealousy in about 80% of cases. So what's interesting is if you go along to a homicide and there are bite marks, in 80% of the case, it's going to be jealousy. So you can't be brainwashed by that statistic because it might be another reason. Uh, but that is a good starter uh, for 10. So can you see if you're the, where this is an example of countless examples where psychology complements policing beautifully? Uh, and unfortunately, in my own humble view, uh, the police service uh, take pay very little credence uh, to psychology and where it can help. So the correlation here, uh, the, the actual biting here, tends to be quite superficial. We then move on a bit here, St sadistic biting. This is uh, linked to uh, the need for power, domination and control. As you can see there, one of the most infamous cases uh, was Ted Bundy. So it can, I put there, and I'll read this out in the last paragraph, it can be noted the causing of physical pain is not in itself the reason for the biting. Not always, uh, not always. But what they do is they do this uh, in a sadistic mode. They want to hurt someone. And the um, the depth of the bite mark is, is starting to increase. So if you look at the first anger impulsive biting, tend to be superficial. This tends to be uh, a lot deeper. Uh, and you can see here a protractor is actually be, being used to measure some of these bite marks uh, here to try and get some evidence together. We then move on to, uh, and forgive me for this, this is the most serious and mercifully is very rare. It's called ego cannibalistic biting. And it's where the person uh, bites in order that they can taste uh, human blood uh, and absorbing the life uh, from the victims. And of course, if you get this sort of behaviour or this sort of case, you need to be onto the press uh, immediately uh, because this person uh, that's responsible for this is often suffering from uh, mental illness. And the correlation with the bite mark is a lot deeper. And I deliberately haven't put on uh, any photographs, but often it involves actually ripping flesh out of... Um, uh, another person's body using the tape. 
Notable bike cases, we've got Ted Bundley, Bundy, uh, Lindy Chamberlain. This case dragged on and on and on for years and years and years. There is her with her little baby Azaria. Many moons ago, that's what she looks like now. But uh, it was uh, there were some bite marks found on a matinee coat, and it went backwards and forwards, whether or not that was a dingo. Uh, in case you don't know, because I didn't know, uh, that's an, a wild uh, Australian dog. Uh, or was it the mum that did the biting? But this went backwards and forwards, and eventually uh, she was acquitted and found not guilty. Dale Bollinger convicted of attempting to snare a young person and eat them, but that was intercepted by the FBI. They put an undercover officer and he was arrested, charged and convicted. Wayne Cousins, uh, again, uh, it saddens me, uh, all of this rhetoric that's going on in the police service. In fact, my uh, police service that I had the privilege and pleasure of working for, for many, many years, uh, this is one of the worst uh, cases I've seen uh, of premeditated murder. The thing is, though, is that no one knows why he did it. Again, uh, in the judges um, uh, not summing up, uh, when he was uh, in his sentencing report, he said that he had no idea why Wayne Cousins did that. Secondly, in the Lucy Letby case, the learned trial judge said exactly the same. So we don't actually know and we can't speculate. I'm being encouraged by my company uh, to uh, go and see Wayne Cousins uh, in prison and ask him why. Why did you do it? These are some of the books. Um, the, some of these are fictional. The Book of Serial Killers there, Jack Rosewood, uh, an encyclopedia of serial killers. And it talks about the world's worst murders. This is a really dear friend of mine, Catherine Yaffe. Uh, she's written this book, fiction, called The Lies She Told. And this one here, again, you can stop as a free download on Kindle. And I thought this was absolutely brilliant, uh, the fall. So that gives you, and we'll go back, uh, I'll finish where I started, and that is, uh, so this is very much subjective. It's what you consider uh, to be the world's worst murderer. And maybe uh, I might do a poll on that, and I might ask you uh, using that index uh, that I've given you and the reason why you consider that, and that might give us a flavour of what we consider collectively as a group to be the world's worst murderers. Okay, so here we go. Uh, these are the upcoming uh, experiences. And what I'd urge you to do, as I say, I'm really sorry, uh, but this is, I'm recording this. Where are we now? This is uh, on Monday the 18th. Actually, it's six o'clock in the morning, I'm going abroad. Uh, so I can't do this live and I didn't want to take the risk of, uh, of trying to broadcast. So it's going to be uploaded to YouTube and uh, as soon as I finish this and you will get that so you can uh, watch and listen to it. But you can see there in October, I've got On The Run. Uh, that's going to be a bit of a surprise, I hope. And in November, I'm going to do something called Living in the Mind of a Killer. And then in December, uh, we're going to have a Christmas uh, crime quiz in aid of the Mind Charity. Uh, that has been good fun. Uh, as a company, I will kick that off uh, with 800 quid. I'm going to put it on as a Just Giving page and encourage you guys to do it. But I'll give you plenty of warning for that. And uh, I apologise, I haven't been as communicative as I could be. And that is because I'm very, very busy uh, at work, lecturing, uh, writing, uh, advising and uh, teaching. Uh, just a couple of things before we finish. Thank you very, very much to coming on uh, to all of you. It's always really, really good to listen to what you're up to. Uh, we've been able to help uh, students with their studies, which is an absolute delight. Uh, in the new year, we've got a true crime festival coming up. Uh, 
and I should say backtracking in October. If you go on to crimelive.co.uk, I'm out on the road uh, quite a lot uh, in Fuller's pub. So I've had some instructions uh, to do some work. And uh, I've um, been invited, and this is the best thing I've ever been invited to do. I've been invited uh, to go up to the Bow Street Museum in London uh, during National Science Week in March. Uh, and I'm going to do a, a Scotland Yard fingerprint masterclass. But I'm linking it uh, to a serial killer who was known as the Air Raid Serial Killer. And uh, I'm researching this at the moment. And uh, not only will I deliver it to you guys uh, in the new year, uh, but I'm also going to do it as a, a walking tour around central London. But I think that's enough for me. So let's just uh, stop this. Uh, stop this. And I'm going to say, as always, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for coming on to uh, this uh, webinar. I hope you enjoy it. It's probably the wrong word. But I hope you get something out of it uh, from a true crime perspective and a psychological perspective. Thank you very much. And uh, look after yourselves. Good night.